last week we started with the first perfection, which is generosity. Actually, uh, um, perfection is, uh, I would prefer to call them uh, trans, uh, what is it? transcendent, transcendent, say generosity, transcendent generosity. Uh, perfection, I always think of that word as a little stressful, you know, like perfection of generosity, like it's just a little bit stressful. Uh, transcending generosity uh, uh, carries the uh, message that, that the word paramita uh, implies. Paramita is the Sanskrit word for what we sometimes translate as perfections or uh, transcendent qualities, say transcendent qualities. Uh, I think transcendent because in the process of transcending, basically one way of thinking is that we start out with say, well, we talked about generosity last week, but here I go again. We start out, say, with generosity, and it's very untranscendent. You know, it's very me and my stuff, and then I'm trying to learn how to be generous and give to others. And we transcend that limitation as we practice. So in that sense, it, there's a, transcends, a, a sense of transcendence, getting better at it. Less, uh, if, if generosity, if the essence of generosity is uh, not uh, giving without attachment, then the more we practice it with that intention, then the less attached we are. And the less attached we are, then the less suffering we feel in our minds. But something, this is a Buddhist, basic Buddhist teaching, when, uh, like for instance, if, if we reduce our attachment, then something else increases. Some quality of our mind increases. So it's not that we're stripping away all the things that we're familiar with and we'll be left with nothing. You know? But when we strip away all of those causes that, that give us grief, uh, then our natural qualities, as I mentioned earlier, of clarity and tranquility and compassion are there and always have been there. That's one of the, the laughable, uh, when you see Buddhas laughing, you know, in some traditions, like, it's like, oh gosh, how could I have missed this all along, <laughs> you know? So what we're doing is stripping away all those factors that have, making, that have been making us miss who we truly are. You know. um, the next uh, transcendent quality is a discipline. Uh, they say, in, uh, when you listen to teachings, they say, uh, is it? Don't listen to the teacher, listen to the words. When you listen to the words, uh, don't, don't listen to the um, kind of literal meaning, but listen to the intended meaning. I just popped into my mind, because I say discipline, I am no, not a good discipline person, but I have notes <laughs> on how to do it. And so I said, don't just look past me and listen to the words. That was my, my point. Mm. 
this, as I say, this, this teaching comes from the Mahayana uh, approach of Buddhism. And what that means, the Mahayana, Mahay means great. Uh, a yana means a, a vehicle. So it's the great vehicle. I mean, uh, the attitude, the attitude is quite vast, Mahayana. And the only reason it's, um, uh, we say Mahayana uh, in distinguish, to distinguish from a, a much more uh, personal or what could be not necessarily derogatory or diminutive sense, but just a, a sense of uh, a smaller vehicle, a smaller uh, vehicle called the Hinayana. Uh, and in a, which has to do with just me. I need to become free of my suffering. That attitude. In the Mahayana, that attitude becomes uh, transformed, developed into, I need to free all beings from suffering. The metaphor is like a mother wants their child, their only child, to be free of suffering. That's what makes them happy. A mother doesn't have to, uh, well, in this ideal mother, doesn't have to uh, make themselves happy after their children are happy. If their children are happy, automatically they're happy. So this uh, Mahayana Buddhism uh, has this sense of it. But the scope is very vast. They say, uh, uh, until all beings whose numbers reach the endless space, uh, I will uh, endeavor to uh, attain enlightenment until all beings are free. Like this kind of idea is very... Uh, uh, very infinite thinking. So the uh, person in a Mahayana uh, training at a certain point gives rise to this aspiration to attain enlightenment, to wake up completely from ignorance and its habits uh, in order to, or for the sake of, all beings, all sentient beings, every single sentient being, the small little sentient beings. And this, this is called the bodhisattva, this individual who gives rise to that aspiration to attain uh, awakening is called the, the bodhisattva. And this practice is the practice, these practices, these six perfections, are the practices associated with the development of the bodhisattva. Going from just a pedestrian, just an ordinary man or woman who just gives, uh, gives rise to that idea to attain enlightenment in order to free, in, uh, for the sake of all beings, in order to benefit all beings. And then the training of that up until they become maybe a, a bodhisattva in the true sense of the word, and then a Buddha. And the Mahayana Buddhist uh, perspective is who becomes a Buddha? Or who, who, who becomes a Buddha? A bodhisattva becomes a Buddha. Or who becomes a bodhisattva? Someone who made a promise to become Buddha. As soon as you make a promise to become Buddha, you're a bodhisattva. 
if that promise was done uh, for the sake of beings. Well, who would make a promise to attain Buddhahood for the sake of beings? Someone who noticed sentient beings and how they were suffering. That's who. And so the first uh, so sort of level, uh, the first uh, yeah, the first level of, of approach for the bodhisattva path is to notice what's going on in the lives of sentient beings, and in some sense, not think that it's okay, like it's okay that beings suffer. Like to not think that, not to uh, fall back to that. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about the causes of suffering, which, as it turns out, have something to do with that attachment we were talking about last week. Karma, uh, this very uh, active emotional life we live of uh, hopes and fears and uh, anger and uh, jealousy and pride and so forth. It's almost as if beings were all afflicted. Not only do we experience the uh, frustration or the, the direct uh, pain and suffering of of our emotional life the dominant when it dominates us that is to say but even as it fades into something else you know it has made an imprint in our minds so that even something that's vaguely similar that caused that first explosion comes we associate it and we relive again the same emotional turmoil. And so this whole, uh, this whole cycle continues. It's called, in Buddhism, it's called samsara. And it's just acting and reacting and then re-reacting and re-reiterating, reiterating again and again. So that's uh, kar called karma. Karma means action and, uh, and the results of action. Uh, so speaking of discipline, um, a discipline is not, we think, well, discipline means a giving up negative actions and practicing or cultivating positive actions. That's true in one sense, but that's not really discipline. That's just uh, logical. You know, that's, just, that's just intelligence working. You know? What discipline here means is uh, training, in a, to, training to develop an attitude of avoiding negative actions. We have to have an attitude. Giving up negative actions, we can tie our hands behind our back, we can uh, uh, you know, put ourselves in some self-imposed prison that prevents us from, from uh, uh, interacting with people that will cause us to do or say negative things. But that's just uh, brute. That's not necessarily associated with any sort of spiritual awakening. Of course we need to know what is harmful. Killing, stealing, lying, de uh, divisive speech, harsh abusive speech, uh, sexual, uh, harmful sexual uh, practice, uh, harmful sexual acts. Uh, then mentally we have like a, uh, 
what is that, uh, um, enmity, basically hatred, and this aggressive envy, and just wrong-headed thinking. Wrong-headed thinking, meaning that it doesn't really matter what you do. There's no, there's no blowback from doing bad things, and there's no benefit from doing good things. That kind of wrong-headed thinking. It's not just, you know, believing in karma, you know. But it, that's what it says, you know, not to believe in cause and effect, basically. It's just, so just uh, that. So there's body or physical, verbal and mental things. So it's to our advantage to know those uh, principles of what brings harm to the doer and to, and incidentally to the person that's being done, but not necessarily. They may be very patient and somebody says something abusive to them, and they may be very patient. So you haven't harmed them, you've harmed yourself. If they're not very patient, and then they, they shoot it back at you, and then you raise the volume, you, you go up, and then it goes up. So we all know this. And you're just, it's just, you're just sinking together. So this is just uh, things to know and to refrain from. We can refrain from physical and verbal things through, uh, I don't know, through, I guess you could say, creative force or uh, self-counseling. By, uh, But the mentally, then the discipline here as a paramita, uh, discipline really means uh, uh, cultivating this uh, continuous attitude of, in this first case, not harming. So there's uh, three kinds of discipline, three kinds of training and discipline is uh, refraining from unwholesome or negative actions, and then the discipline of creating uh, virtuous actions, and then the discipline of uh, benefiting others. Those three, three things. For we beginners, uh, of course, the, the emphasis is on uh, cultivating this uh, continuous attitude that avoid that avoid of, of avoiding negative actions, and we, uh, in order to do that, we have to um, know what the uh, disadvantages are to negative actions, what the benefit is to avoiding them. I mean, it can't just be a, a rule, you know. We don't really like rules, I, I, I don't think, you know. And uh, when it comes to our habits, rules don't go far enough. So we have to use our intelligence and understand and think about, not just understand, well, we need to think a lot about what the advantages and disadvantages are of, of negative actions and giving up negative actions. We just can't have a, we just can't have a, treat it like a religion, okay, basically, I, I don't know, like I, the Buddhist, Buddhism to me is, is not a religion in that sense, I don't even know what sense we could think of it as a religion to me, you know, there's just, it's just very practical and scientific, and I think uh, we, uh, modern kind of Americans, 
are very practical and like it or not, we do think inherently, kind of scientifically, we can help it. You know? And uh, and so the way Buddhism is presented from this point of view of cause and effect is very, uh, to me, it's a very easy, goes it goes down very easily when we think of it as in that those terms. Uh, is that clear so far? Have I? I'm not sure I'm clear about what you started out by saying with the attitude uh, to try to refrain from the negativity. <coughs> What I heard, what well, I thought I heard was but, uh, that, that we don't want to get into, you know, ne ne negative thoughts, feelings, and actions it, it produces negative karma and positive produces positive. Or that that's going to end up very selfish. What coming from there? Okay. Okay. Very. Okay. Good. Excellent. Since this is the path of the bodhisattva, and the bodhisattva path is, you know, begins with this promise, a vow to uh, basically since, to wake up for the benefit of all beings. With this altruistic, altruistic intention to attain Buddhahood. Buddha, the word Buddha means oh, wake up woken up. So we want to wake up. Uh, and we made that promise. So anything that's, that retards or stands in the way of that promise is, can be considered to be negative. Anything that uh, is conducive to the accomplishment of that promise to wake up for the benefit of beings, we can consider to be positive. That's the extent of the moral, ethical position of, of uh, say, Buddhism. It's a, mm -hmm. What brings us closer to the truth is positive and wholesome, good. And what uh, uh, takes us further from the truth or prevents us from moving towards the truth when we want to is negative, unwholesome, counterproductive. Okay, that's the. Uh, so the 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 view of discipline here is is that the bodhisattva path. Mm -hmm. that, We can't assume, and, and there's always going to be some sense of our own importance, or you know, self, uh, self, uh, what do you say, self-interest. Is that what you use? Kind of self-interest. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it would be a little abstract if we completely forgot about that when actually we are that way. You know, we are that way. If we have... Mm, okay. Basically what it comes down to is what is it that needs to be uprooted? What is it need, that needs to be avoided, avoided, really? What really needs to be avoided are those negative motivations that cause us to say and do things. Yeah. You know, we can bind ourselves with certain disciplines to, to keep us from acting or saying things. Uh, but here when I say attitude of avoiding suffering, uh, avoiding unwholesome actions, 
really has to do with training the mind. Mm -hmm. And what you're training the mind is, is in avoiding actions, mental actions that have arisen from uh, attachment, from aversion, from ignorance and delusion, from pride, from jealousy, and all the branch branches of those. And not only that, but uprooting the habits of that. We can stop something mentally, verbally, and physically. We can interrupt it, but how can we uproot it? How can we get that, the cause of re, re, the repeating of it, the habit of it? And that comes about through training in this attitude of avoiding negative actions, because that training embodies uh, what, what, not training embodies, mm. what that training is, is being training, and actually what we've been talking about a little bit is in being careful, just being careful. And how can we be careful? Uh, first, we have to really appreciate that we have this opportunity, this a human life, and it was hard won, you know, to have this human life. It was hard to it was hard to get it. Why? Because it took virtue. It took it took virtuous actions to mature in this circumstance we find ourselves in, where unlike. <clears throat> uh, any other creature, we can make decisions about what we do. We are not 100% instinctual. And when we're instinctual, uh, then our habit will become more and more on the negative side. I mean, you can look. But the people can decide, is this going is this, is there, is this, to my, is this to even to my own personal advantage to do this? To kill or to steal? So we can question, you know, that's not, and I'm not just talking about human beings, I'm basically talking kind of to you guys, you know? I mean, you're here, like, why? You know? There's a lot of things you could be doing this morning. Well, you have this spiritual or some kind of a, a sensitivity. And that is the result of karma. That's the result of your virtuous actions. And so to appreciate that more and more makes you careful because you can begin to feel or understand that if I clean up my act, if I can reduce my being driven by my emotions, I'll become happier. Even just that brute self, self-interest is fine for the time being. It's even fine to like we say, to cultivate an attitude of avoiding. Well, avoiding falls under the category of aversion, which is a poison of the mind, attachment aversion. Well, I'm going to develop an aversion for negative actions. I have aversion anyway, so, but I'm going to apply it skillfully. I'm not just going to throw the baby out with the water. I might be able to use this aversion for benefit, for my promise to wake up, to be fulfilled. For the time being, I'll use this aversion to avoid negative actions that definitely obstruct my path. And I'll cling to uh, virtuous actions 
for the time being because it will promote the fulfillment of my aspirations. Those, that kind of aversion will take care of itself. And later, it will, they will have to be purified also. But in the meantime, for us especially, they're very handy. Because we do need to know what to give up, and not just intellectually. We need to use our aversion and, and heighten, sharpen our aversion to negative actions. That's discipline. Not just not doing them, but really using our, our, our inheritance of the poisons of the mind to avoid negative actions that obstruct our practice in benefiting others. <coughs> we say uh, uh, discipline is uh, 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 refraining, avoiding, uh, refraining from negative actions, uh, creating positive actions, and benefiting beings. We can't benefit beings, says in the teachings. Oh, forget it. That's, we're not even going to talk about that in this chapter, because you can't do it. What you can do is learn to give up negative actions and create a, a virtue. Those we can do. On second thought, maybe we can't do create virtue because we're so riddled with negative actions. So really, the first thing we need to do is give up negative actions. There's no room to squeeze in the virtue when we're so negative, when our habits, and not our wishes, you know, not our intellectual wishes. I have no, uh, you know, there's no argument that you have great intellectual aspirations and the vow that we take to attain enlightenment is intellectually noble. But it hasn't hit the ground because of our habits. And we can't just let it sit in our heads because, uh, I don't know, I'm, I think I might be on the higher end of everyone here, but I'm forgetting things. And if I just keep my vow to benefit others and my promise to attain enlightenment as an intellectual uh, fantasy, I'm going to forget it. I mean, no doubt. I don't mean just forget it like a lapse either. I mean like it's, uh, what do you call that? It's... Uh, formatted away. <laughs> <laughs> Old age is a formatting process. Uh, but we, we have to change our, our uh, sort of, sp our, I don't know, spiritual biology. We have to change our, our being. That begins in the mind, but then we have to really look and see the real purpose of discipline is to uproot these mental afflictions of attachment, aversion, stupidity, and so forth. Does that, does that settle, settle you out? Is that clear? Yeah, it, you have to remember the beginning of it is that this is a bodhisattva path. So the discipline is a bodhisattva path. In the Hinayana path, yeah, you learn, okay, you give up uh, you know, uh, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, uh, divisiveness, heart, abusive speech, gossip. Those seven general categories having to do with body and speech, you give up. And maybe you uh, shave your head, carry a stick, wear clothes that remind you of that. Uh, in the best case. You know. uh, sometimes you do those kind of things and then you assume that you've done it. You know. Oh, yeah. So, but uh, that's for your own protection. We take ordination or things like that to protect yourself from negativity that will cause you suffering. A bodhisattva path is you take a vow to attain awakening, not just become free of suffering, but you take a vow to awaken 
for the benefit of sentient beings. And so the discipline of that includes the previous, includes that those body and speech things, but also introduces the idea of mind, training the mind in an attitude that avoids those things. That's not necessarily implied by, say, becoming a monk or a nun or taking on the burden of certain uh, disciplines for your personal uh, safety and, and uh, uh, diminishing your suffering. <clears throat> those vows are broken when you violate those physical or verbal uh, actions, and then you repair them with confession. A bodhisattva path, what, what, what's, what's, what's violated is the disciplines of the bodhisattva vow, and one of those vows is to, to renounce uh, your vow, to give up on sentient beings, basically. Oh, I can't do it. It's ridiculous for me to think of it anymore. I can't do this anymore. Or, okay, I'm good, with, I'm good at liberating all of you guys from suffering, but this side I can't deal with. You know? That even they say when you uh, fail to help one being who needs help and you could help them, you've broken your bodhisattva vow. When you prevent another person who's taken the bodhisattva vow from creating merit. I say this to particularly our staff. When you prevent, <laughs> when you prevent, no, this is, this is scripture, you know, this is in the gospel of the Bodhisattva. When you prevent someone who's taken the Bodhisattva vow from creating merit, you broke your, you broke your vow. So it's, 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 uh, it's a lot to do with the attitude. So in the beginning, as beginners, the big emphasis is on uh, cr creating this attitude of avoiding negative actions. And then whatever virtue we can muster up, we do it and we do it. And uh, we do it and dedicate that virtue to the enlightenment of all beings. That's what we, that's what we can do now. They say, in order to benefit beings, you have to have reached a certain stage in the bodhisattva path. Otherwise, it's like, uh, it's like passing, it's like, you know, at night, uh, you give somebody your flashlight, and they go and they're in the light, but you're in the dark. So until you've reached a certain point, that's how you benefit others. You, you give them, it's like a, pouring from one container to another, that the first, your container is empty. You know? So we can't truly benefit others. And by benefiting others in the bodhisattva uh, context, the language of benefiting others is benefiting all sentient beings who are equal to space. So that, that kind of discipline uh, happens down the path a bit. You, know, you have to come to a certain point, path of seeing. <clears throat> so the... <clears throat> uh, so this uh, giving up, uh, knowing what to give up, and then being careful about it. And you become careful about it by reflecting on the opportunities you have and the potential. It's not just, wow, I'm really a lucky person to have all my uh, merit has matured as my life now, but what about it? This life has potential. We can change our future. Instinct doesn't 
change your future, acting instinctually. Changing the future meaning uh, like upgrading. And if it's upgraded with that altruistic intention to attain enlightenment, then it assures your continued involvement and the conditions necessary for that path to become uh, accomplished. So that's the, the, the idea in, the, in discipline. It's really about how to benefit others. Appreciating that we can think like that, we, we can think to benefit others, and we can uh, enrich those thoughts and embellish those thoughts and act on those thoughts to some extent. How we act on those thoughts is to uh, refrain from negative actions. That's the path of the bodhisattva. And we do it not for our own sake, but we do it for the sake of all sentient beings, not just one or two or ten or fifteen, or those that are in my my group. You know. <clears throat> so reflecting on this, the qualities of this life and the freedoms and advantages we have, and most particularly the potential, that this is just the perfect basis, this, this life I have, this is the perfect basis to wake up to my true nature, enlightenment. Perfect basis is taught. So reflecting on that makes us more careful. And then reflecting on what it is that's preventing that from being accomplished, which is these um, the poisons of the mind, or what are called kleshas, the mental afflictions, anger, hatred, uh, attachment, desire, lust, uh, compulsion, neediness, uh, Pride, conceit, self-importance, envy, uh, avarice, 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 uh, all these things. And then the mental, the, the, all these mental afflictions. Like I say, they, they, they cause us suffering in the immediate moment of their experience, and they plant seeds for future suffering. It's like I say, uh, it's like throwing a rock into a, a, a lake. Uh, two things happen. Once is the waves go out, cause disturbance, and second, the uh, rock is in the lake now. So we, we have a, we get react, we react to somebody, and we feel the suffering of it, and then something's planted in our hearts that will, <clears throat> it's not like a rock, it's like a seed, and it will spring up again. You know. Even when somebody who even looks like somebody that made us mad comes in, or the sound of their voice is a completely <laughs> different person, or the skin color, yeah, something like that can't help but react in that same... That's the habit that has to be uprooted by these... by carefulness. It's called carefulness. Pakya means carefulness. And we have to cultivate carefulness by initially... initially this, uh, this uh, golden opportunity we have as a, as a person with all of our uh, sort of circumstances and advantages and this spiritual impulse that has to be there too, and we have that. And so taking that together, appreciating that, that makes you more careful. And, and appreciating that, that your intention is thwarted by your own emotional life and the destructive nature of it and the repetitiveness of it. 
the tedious repetitiveness of it. Uh, that's what has to be, um, what is it, like Shantideva says, like that's the enemy. That's the enemy. Not the one who's making you irritated, but your own habit of irritation. And so you look within for the resolution of that. Practice on your mind. And so realizing, in this case, who's the enemy? Who's, what is it that's standing in the way of the fulfillment of your noble aspirations? It's your own mind's confusion, hatred, anger, and attachment, and neediness, and desire. All those things, that's what has to be uprooted and can be uprooted. Not to lose heart. You might say, well, hey, that's all I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have bad days. And so from like <laughs> uh, 7 a.m. or to like midnight, I am in a bad state. You know? Or I'm in such a bad state, it's not even from 7 a.m. to midnight, I can't even get out of bed. That's a condition. I mean, so it's really, <clears throat> we can become very disheartened by the uh, attention we've been giving our habits. Uh, but, hey, you are a human, you are a, a being, a thinking, breathing human being who can do things. You have, the, you have everything that it takes. You have well, Buddhism, they, we call it Buddha nature. In other words, we have this potential, this awakening potential. It's just our nature. It's just... Mm, uh, it just hasn't happened. It hasn't, we haven't woken up yet. And it's not that we have to become enlightened. That's a way of talking. You have to talk about it somehow, right? It's just a way of talking. Become Buddha. Become enlightened. What, the actual process is one of only getting rid of these afflictive emotions. We, we want to become someone who is completely free of afflictive emotions. That's enlightenment. Like some, Dr. Rinpoche, somebody came to him one time and he, he said, I remember everything, actually. I don't remember always so much, and not that much happened, but I can remember the ferry boat and the people, Rinpoche sitting there, and this woman sitting there saying, I'm enlightened, because it caught my attention. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was, I was always sitting there listening, and she says, yes, I'm enlightened, you know. And then Rinpoche said, do you, do you have anger? Oh, yes, yeah, sometimes. And then, do you have desire? Oh, yeah, sometimes, you know. And he says, yeah. That's not enlightened. <laughs> enlightened is not having those. So that's, that's, our, that's what we talk about when we say wake up or become Buddhahood. We just mean to become free of what is f become freeable of. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that uh, construction. Uh, to become free of, of what we, we can become free of and must become free of. And in a way, we've promised to become free of it. You know? uh, why can we become free? Because of impermanence. Like all of our conditions, whatever they are, no matter how uh, bottomless they may seem, uh, they all are made up of accumulations of moments and experiences. So they're not solid, they're just composite. They're made up of things. What is it? What is it? <clears throat> They have no being of their own. That's is how you get rid of emotions, is by n noticing that your anger has no 
being. It has no. Uh, it has no uh, inherent characteristic that makes it what it is. That makes it a thing. It's a, I think if I can, three things happen to us. First, an emotion arises. Second, our mind experiences it. These are like the, not sequential exactly, but these are the like the three characteristics, say, of this. One is that there's a, an experience. Two, that there's a mind that, that, it, that notices that there's an experience. Three, none of that exists. And that, that third point, that none of it exists as such, can be determined by looking at it. And that's how you uproot, uproot these gnarly, persistent habits, is by again and again noticing, noticing, not believing, but directly through, I don't know, uh, intuition, like intelligent, penetrative in intuition, noticing, does this exist or not? I'm not denying that I'm really angry, but does it actually exist? And try to find, where did it come from? Where is it dwelling? And where does it go? <clears throat> and that's how you find that our emotions, these conflicting afflictions of our emotions, have no inherent being. They, they have no inherent life of their own. They're just a mere appearance. Where do they dwell when they're there? Inside your body, outside your body, both, neither? Is it? What size is it? Is your anger big? We say big, but how big? If it exists, <laughs> For something to actually exist, it needs to have certain characteristics that identify its existence. Like it must have come from somewhere. Like I see you come in, but I don't know where you came from. I said, well, where'd you come from? Oh, I came from there. And that's why you're here. Okay, where's my anger? Where does it come from? It can't come from outside. Somebody can't make anger come to you, can they? How can somebody make you angry? What is it, like they shoot something out and it goes to your little <laughs> something? It comes through the air or something? Or the, 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 the people, are, everyone's just doing their thing. You know, that you stumble over a thing in the dark, you can get furious as you want and smash that thing. But that's not the cause of it. That didn't put anything in you. <clears throat> that's like you, I see people train little children, you know, like they, oh, like, take that chair and hit it. Yeah, hit it, you know, boom, 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 boom. You know, I mean, that might help a child. I don't know. I've, I wasn't one of them. I didn't read that page. But uh, <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, last time I saw somebody do that, you know, yeah, I, you know, slap, slap this table, you know, and you hit your arm, a little child hits their arm on it, you know, it, it, it gets them over it maybe, but then they, they must see the absurdity of it to blame things outside, you know. And the same with the people irritate us and things, that's our irritation, they don't irritate us. Even if they try, they couldn't. Those are circumstances. You found yourself in a circumstance. It's your seed that sprouted. 
your seed, your cause. Outer, our outer life, our exterior life, even our body as an exterior, exterior part of our life, our bodies. Uh, the cause of our suffering is, is, is in our mind. And all these other aspects just create circumstances for the seeds of our karma to ripen to our mind. So we should be very uh, diligent and determined to uproot those uh, seeds. Avoid negative actions and their habits. Not just avoid negative actions, but avoid negative actions and their habits, our tendencies. Like these scrolls you buy, the, well, I don't know, if you, yeah, people still buy posters, I hope. You know, posters, you know, they come in a tube, then like Rinpoche used to say, and then you, you open it up and there it is, just perfectly, just like you expected it to be, but then you release it and it rolls back up again. That's a habit. That's like our habits. We get over something, you know, through like the force of discipline, then we, we back off and psh, same thing happens again and again. So we need a method. Tape in the corners. You know, that's the soft approach, you know. The tough approach is turn it upside down and go backwards. You know, a little bit more, you know, roll it backwards. Antidote, counter, counter, uh, uh, what do you say? Mm, contradict it. That's why we say instead of we said like last week, you know, we how to get rid of attachment is to give. So when through the the tranquility that comes from becoming used to avoiding negativity. And that training in avoiding negative actions is a continuum. It's a, a continuity, even when you're sleeping. There's just this, this, this stream, this thread of avoiding negativity. That's called being careful. Like Kempo Nakchul in his teachings says how we should meditate on discipline by saying, you know, even at the cost of my life, I will never kill a, another being. I will never uh, incite, I never uh, like hire somebody, or incite someone to kill someone, and I'll never rejoice in someone dying being killed. And a fourth is to uh, make a pledge of that. I will never give up on that pledge to never kill. You need two things. You make a, a pledge not to say kill, rejoice in killing, or hire some, or incite someone to kill. And secondly, to never give up that pledge. Say that every night you go to bed, you are down all ten non-virtues, stealing. Even if I die, I will never steal. I'll never ask anyone to steal, and I'll never rejoice at anyone stealing, and I'll never give up that pledge. And he says, speech-wise, he goes, the minute, this is why you have to train in being careful by knowing how negative it is to be... Uh, or how harmful and negative it is to speak bad speech. He says the two, th he mentions two things. One is the just when you're speaking, when you feel yourself exaggerating or lying, 
to say, speak the truth immediately. Just cut that off and say exactly what's true. I, we, uh, many people, especially couples and people, they always say, like, you always do that. Or if we're talking about somebody, they always do that. Or they never do that. That is a lie. That is a perfect example of how your seeds have embedded themselves in your mind so that all, any time something happens, it all, always connects to that seed. And you've, you're deceiving yourself. You know? So he says, any time you, you are going to say something that's not true, like you, oh, you did this time. <laughs> you know, that makes a huge difference in your karma. And then he says, when the minute, not the minute, but what is it? The, when you feel yourself uh, saying something divisive, in other words, trying to create sides, right? And so trying to split people up into groups. The minute you start, uh, when you're about to utter something about somebody so that this person will be on uh, against them or something like that, divisive speech, the minute you're about to do that, he said, you hit yourself on the head or punch yourself in the stomach. He said, Those kind of things actually work. <laughs> you know. When I was a, a young teenager or something, you know, boys, sometimes they spit, you know, you know, right? It's like, I don't know what it is, but I used to spit all the time. And then I, I could watch myself doing that. I said, That's, every time I was going to spit, I'd hit myself in the head. I like, was 14 or something, I think. You know, then I stopped. It's too painful. <laughs> you know? uh, so that's my that's my spiritual experience. Because when I read that in Kemal Action, I said, "Oh, I, I, yeah, that's true. I, I recognize it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I. So you, yeah. So these kind of things. So this this training to be careful. Sometimes it's you have to hit yourself up the head. What do you say? Upside the head." I don't know if Rinpoche ever taught that, actually. But uh, I know at uh, Drupchans, and sometimes I'll see somebody sitting at Drupchan and they'd hit themselves. So they might, you know, he might have mentioned that to them. But it's a very good, good thing to do. It's with speech things. Well, maybe the spitting is speech, too. I mean, the mouth moving. Maybe it's a connection. But anyway, this is a great master who suggested that. So let's hear more of those slaps out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the whole, the whole thing is, oh, OK. Uh, So creating merit, the second one, I'll just touch on it. But when uh, uh, the thing about creating merit, teachings are always about the small things. Do small little things and dedicate the merit to the enlightenment of all beings. Small things. Drops, like the drops are what make the bucket overflow. Even, you know, you... Uh, every time, if, if you're a Buddhist person or something, then there's many small things you do. Like every time you pick up a Dharma book, put it on your head out of respect. Or uh, like in the text, talks about every time you see a Buddha, then take your hat off out of respect. Just that one moment of respect, that's what, that's what virtue is. It's not... Uh, yeah, that's what virtue is. Like, have you walk past this prayer wheel house? Do you just walk past? You turn all those prayer wheels? Are you going this way? You walk around the stupas? They say even uh, 
uh, on a dog chasing a pig around a stupa, uh, cause them, uh, improve them, you know, cause their rebirth to be better. Or, so uh, anything, that's why we create all these little, they're not exactly tricks, uh, because the, the things themselves embody or uh, express qualities uh, of enlightenment. But mm, uh, don't overlook small things. Do little things all the time. Do little things as much as you can. That's how it goes. That's what the teaching always says. Uh, giving up negativity, we're focused on like the very core of our being, you know, anger and attachment. But the virtue, lots of little things. You know, one candle, cause, and then everything we do with a huge dedication. The hugeness is in the dedication, not the actual act. But this dedicate, I, I light this candle, or I offer this, or do this for the benefit of all sentient beings. Every time we antidote anger or, de or attachment, that's virtue. Like not practicing unvirtue as a instrument of accomplishing your noble aspirations that not doing unvirtue is virtue, and you dedicate the merit of that to the enlightenment of all beings. This one, a, a king um, talking with the Buddha Shakyamuni, I'll, I'll end, I, I didn't realize so late. That's, <laughs> there's no benefit to taking my watch off or leaving it on, I still didn't look at it, <laughs> sorry. But there's the one, the king, uh, he, he couldn't practice, he, he, he liked Dharma, he liked the Bodhisattva idea and so forth, but then the Buddha said, you can't practice uh, all these six perfections because you're too busy. Uh, but uh, two things you'd need to do. One is uh, always arouse this intention to attain enlightenment for the benefit of beings. Always cultivate that. And anything you're able to do, the smallest little thing you do, uh, dedicated to the enlightenment of all beings. So these two things, this, this uh, uh, aspiration to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all beings, and then dedicating everything you do to the benefit of all beings. That's what, that's the practice to do. And I, for people like us who are really busy, that's, he said, if, if you do that, if you, have, if you maintain or cultivate this aspiration to attain enlightenment for the sake of all beings and dedicate anything you do to that enlightenment, all the six perfections are practiced. All these six transcendent perfections are practiced. And practice means accomplished. So maybe just that I'll leave, I'll leave you with, uh, so that give you something to chew on. Okay. Are there any questions? I don't know. <coughs> only one. Only one. Uh, the only talker again today. But, uh, 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 okay. I I heard. Two things, emotional tedium and free of afflictive emotions. I, I think I've worked on being free of afflictive emotions, but sometimes I fear I'm into emotional tedium. <laughs> or I, I check it out sometimes and it seems like Hey, I'm not feeling anything. Oh, okay, that's not what I meant by emotional uh, tedium. Yeah. Uh, and at least from my person, uh -huh. I don't think I've replaced it with a, that the opposite of emotional tedium is, is joy <coughs> and, and, and bliss. Or I, I took 
free of afflictive emotions and then turned it into emotional deviance. Okay, that's and good. I, I'll, I'll remember that too. Yeah. 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 So, so, what are some methods? Oh, probably a stupid question for putting joy and bliss back into the emotions instead of just leaving them vacant. Uh, that the emotions are, or, or, or it, it feels like the emotions are just being kept vacant. Uh huh. Okay. Instead of having some positive emotion. Some feeling. Yeah. Well, that then you make your vow, renew your intention to attain complete, unsurpassable, perfect awakening as the best possible way to really benefit others. Okay, so you don't go for joy and bliss, you go for the vow. The vow. I'm not saying you don't go for joy and bliss, <laughs> but the name I'm giving it is complete, unsurpassable, and perfect awakening. You know, uh, but if you practice the virtues, like you said, in very small quantities as you practice them, would that not ultimately bring you mm -hmm. joy and bliss? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's this, um, all of our virtue should be impelled by this altruistic intention. So that's the kind of virtue we're talking about, is that virtue that is, is impelled by this altruistic intention to wake up for the benefit of beings. Then that virtue will become inexhaustible. If we just do something good to fill space, you know, like, uh, then there, that, that kind of virtue, karmically, the effect of that kind of virtue has a, uh, it's got a shelf life. It will become exhausted when the, when it, when it reaches fruition or when you get, the next time you get irritated, you know. <laughs> or angry, it'll, it'll burn that seed, so to speak. But if you have this intention, I'm going to you know, move this little beetle off the path and put him on the grass, not to save the beetle alone, but may all beings be led to the path, and may they be free from obstacles and so forth, and may all beings attain enlightenment. That changes the karma of that simple little act. You, know, you feed your kitty or your doggy its little things, its cans or box of stuff, you know, then, you know, may, may your dog's name, I don't know, you know, may this uh, nourish and make my dog or cat or bird happy, and may all birds and cats and dogs be happy, may they live at peace, may they be led to the path of enlightenment, and may that path have be free of obstacles, and may they accomplish enlightenment before me. You know, just one little kibble <laughs> becomes a cause of enlightenment, you know. <laughs> So how do you um, uproot some of these negative emotions without causing a negative repression of emotions? Uh, the, the, I mean, t just the, the answer is to uh, see that, see that those emotions have no inherent existence of their own. Wisdom, done through wisdom. They say, free your own mind through wisdom, free the minds of others through compassion.
The idea of the, is that wisdom and compassion are inseparable, just like uh, uh, you know, heat and light from a candle. You get, they're inseparable. So our, our nature is of the nature of the inseparability of wisdom and compassion. So through that wisdom aspect, we free our own minds. And through that natural arising of the compassionate aspect, when our minds are free through wisdom, then that compassion is what liberates others. Good, good question. Okay. So then uh, let's uh, dedicate that merit of what we did today. Yes. Sitting, coming, driving, all, everything. Like you decided to come. That was virtuous. Then now uh, dedicate that to the complete awakening uh, of all beings that will free them from their afflictive emotions, their suffering, and uh, reveal to them their own inherent, pure, compassionate nature. So just dedicate what these, uh, this virtue of this. <clears throat>